Hi everyone and welcome to the Imagining a New We video blog with me, Dr. Samantha Cotrera, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. Uh, for those of you who might be new to the video series, I started this series in January of 2020 to talk about, you know, little elements of pedagogy and practice that teachers can bring into their classrooms to make them more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for students. I think what we're seeing right now in early June 2020 is how important that this work is, not just for this particular moment of social change and activism and resistance, but also for a long-term commitment for doing this work. Um, what has been really fantastic is that, well, fantastic is, is relative, I guess, but that when we went into lockdown for the pandemic at the end of March, I reached out to historians and educators and archivists and community creators about whether or not the ideas about history may have shifted during this time, whether or not history education might uh, change after this time, and whether or not we can imagine a new we um, during and after this time. And when I say imagine a new we, I mean these circles of inclusion that help us really think about who we understand in our national imaginaries and how we can complicate and challenge and um, develop the complexities of this. So students in our class are complex, connected students that are waiting for us to be able to narrate this world that we're in, um, can see themselves within the histories that we have taught. So with the pandemic, I've been able to talk to all these educators and historians about these questions and it has been such a rich conversation. It has allowed me to be able to reach out to people too to talk about particular events in history like the Winnipeg general strike or the 102nd anniversary of white women getting the vote in Canada. I reached out to a couple historians in the States to talk about their, the upcoming holiday, Juneteenth. Juneteenth is a holiday that commemorates slaves being emancipated in 1865. And I just thought it would be a really great opportunity to be able to bring these histories to the, to the series. So this is one of the first videos that I am recording on one day and it's going to go up the next and I am just so excited to be able to talk with this scholar, this, this very prominent scholar on this humble but important, as I said in another video, uh, video series. I could spend the whole video just introducing Julian Chambliss. I am so excited to have him here with me. He is an English and history professor at Michigan State University. He is also the curator of the MSU History Museum at the university itself. He is a scholar that's focused on race, culture, power related to real and imagined urban spaces. And what that has also meant is um, he does a lot of work in the like comic book superhero universe. like. Uh, like the Marvel Universe, which I don't know anything about, so please don't, please don't ask me. Um, he also obviously has done some work on Juneteenth. He is an award-winning podcast, and I'm really excited to, to see how uh, this conversation can help develop and strengthen the conversations and social movements going on right now. So let's go over to Zoom. Hello, thank you so much for uh, responding to my invitation to talk about Juneteenth, especially in relation to the, the social revolution that is happening right now. Um, I'm really excited to, to talk with you about these ideas of pandemic pedagogy. Um, but before we begin, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm, my name is Julian Chambliss. I'm a professor of English uh, at Michigan State University. I'm also the Val Berriman Curator of History at the MSU Museum, and I'm a core faculty in something called the Consortium for Critical Diversity and Digital Age Research here at MSU, which goes by the acronym CEDAR. And I'm also the co-director of the Digital Humanity and Literary Cognition Lab here at MSU. You know, what's been really um, cool about this series is to be able to see all these like interdisciplinary ways that we're bringing ideas of history together and that's one of the reasons why I was really drawn to your your work because of this like interdisciplinary public history English history you know everything together so thank you again oh no thank you for asking me happy to be here 
Um, so let's start with the first question. I ask everyone in the pandemic pedagogy series three questions, but you know, the context as we were talking about has shifted and changed so much. So the first question is whether or not um, the ideas of history have changed at all for you during COVID. Um, for me, there has been some kind of shifting and I'm much more aware of, for example, um, marking particular moments in history uh, because of the fact that we aren't kind of organized in a classroom or maybe in, in with community groups. Um, so have your ideas about history changed at all? And again, we got in touch about Juneteenth. I don't know if this is like a good time for you to talk about kind of that history related to, related to these times. Well, you know, I, I do think that the importance of history um, is really central to my thinking right now. I mean, I've, I've thought about that a lot. And um, when you were sort of like inquiring about Juneteenth, I really thought like, well, you know, that's really a pivotal event that sort of fits into a pattern that some, in some ways explains the, the, the landscape that we're in right now. And in terms of like the sort of systematic failure on the part of um, the people in charge to sort of deliver on the ideology that they, they articulate, right? And the consequences for people. So I think that history becomes very important. In the case of something like Juneteenth, you know, I think about that in part because, you know, the idea of this holiday that's articulated by African Americans that most white people don't know about, um, most white Americans never heard of Juneteenth, but it's very, very important to African-Americans really, it's pivoting on this idea that African-Americans celebration of freedom is forestalled, right? Because, you know, the actual event really is the sort of like the moment that Black people find out that they're free, even though like legally they already had been free three years before. And this idea that um, the rights that you have can be forestalled by forces out in the world and what do you have to do to sort of like um, become aware of them and sort of achieve them and sort of celebrate them and make them feel, I think is a recurring theme in terms of like the American historical experience and really the Western hemisphere's experience. And, and these questions of colonialism and oppression of power that are connected to these, these moments of like when people are trying to make real the theories of freedom and the theories of citizenship really do, I think, matter a great deal because how do they do that, right? In the case of Juneteenth, one of the things about that holiday is that it's it's connected to what was for many years for African-Americans, public displays of citizenship. Like they would march through the streets. They would have these huge celebrations like you know, Emancipation Day and Juneteenth. Like these are, these are holidays that celebrated citizenship and a kind of public identity as a citizen in defiance of uh, oppression and systemic um, erasure in the public sphere, like this effort on the part of a kind of uh, racist institutions and racist, racist individuals to silence people, to, to marginalize them. And being in public spaces, demonstrating, marching through the streets, having parades was an important part of like establishing the parameters of a real citizenship, like a material citizenship meant that you had to walk the streets. And so it's no surprise to me that I, I see people in a moment where they're trying to articulate um, a better vision of freedom that they're walking on the streets, right? Like that makes mm -hmm. actually perfect sense from a historical standpoint. Well, and I, I think too, you know, people, we're saying when the protests first started, like, well, we still have COVID, like, why are you gathering in groups? But I, I think the way that you're articulating that it's like this legacy of like identifying that I am a citizen, like you, you can't not see me. And as a collective, that's even more, that's more important, that's more powerful. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the thing about COVID and the danger that it poses is that does it does it pose a greater danger than the systematic erasure of your your person, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and, and I think for a lot of, of people, uh, the idea that they're already being erased in a slow, steady, 
way by a system that is indifferent and uncaring that allows for systemic uh, deficits to negatively affect their lives every day up to and including you might be randomly killed is is more dangerous right like mm -hmm. covid is a virus it doesn't really doesn't really want to kill black people more than white people it's just <laughs> able to because of all the other horrible things that have happened in society right so for black people covid is just another example of how the system is systemically um, trying to hurt them or, or failing to live up to its obligations to them. And I think that language of the failure of the system to live up its obligations resonates not just simply with Black people, but also, as you can see, when you look at these crowds, it's not just Black people marching through the streets. It's a lot of people that recognize that, in some ways, uh, our assumptions about what the system is supposed to deliver, it's failing to do that, and it's failing very deliberately, like it's a choice. Right? It's a choice for the system not to provide uh, health care to everybody. In our case, we don't necessarily have that problem. We can't. Uh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> choice. You know, it's a choice in, in the context of the United States for us not to have a social safety net similar to most the industrialized world. And the consequences of that choice are really clear because as bad as COVID has been in other parts of the world, Arguably, it's worse here because of those choices around not protecting people at a fundamental level, right? And at the very bottom of that, that heap of like negative choices are people of color, right? So they die more and they suffer more, but other people are also suffering from that kind of indifference. You know, one of the, one of the really strong themes that has come up through the pandemic pedagogy series is how the pandemic has really uh, demonstrated or allowed us to to really like not ignore the way that our systems don't function for everyone and they weren't designed to function for everyone and um, and like you know in the series we've talked a lot about k-12 uh, history education in, in particular and about like well how are students now going to be able to like how can we even pretend that students are going to have an equitable um, learning experience like we can't even pretend that and I I, I see that um, I see that a lot of the, the resistance right now is to kind of you know what you're saying like demanding a system that can better that can live up to the promise that it keeps saying that it's making right and i and i think that, that that too becomes like a historical question right why is it that the system has failed to deliver on some of these fundamental things around uh, citizenship and I, and I often think about this uh in terms of these sort of fundamental failures because you know the united states is, is a highly ideological place i mean we're really sort of built a lot on norms, not rules, right? And so one of the things about the situation is that, you know, why we don't have rules that guarantee X, Y, and Z, where in a lot of other countries, they do, like they have these rules that like, that make it a requirement for the government to operate in, in a such and such a way. And we have sort of tended to, to sort of shy away from that. And part, of, and part of the, I think, the consequences of that are very much the people in power saying, oh, don't worry, this system will, will lift every boat. You don't have to require it to do so, right? So things like the minimum wage or things like healthcare, um, there were moments in the past, in the historical past, where people have banded together and really pressed for these systemic changes They've often been forestalled by people in power saying, well, we don't need this. Or as you see today, people saying like, well, you're asking the wrong way, right? Like you're, you're, you're too, you're too demanding of the system to deliver the people, um, the fruits of citizenship, but that's almost never, it's almost never really true. And those moments where we, you know, sort of embrace these changes, some of those norms, like some of those practices, is we don't 
Americans don't really question, right? We don't question Social Security, but from a historical standpoint, that was really controversial when it was introduced, but it was only introduced because we were in the midst of the worst, at the time, at the time, the worst global economic downturn ever. And so, you know, to respond to the danger posed by people losing faith in the system, and I, you know, I think of the New Deal is that, right? Like the first and second New Deal in American history context are reactions to the sense that the system is failing. And what we need, we need the government to do more. And, and now we are in a moment where people are pretty sure the system is failing. And so the question is, is the government going to do more? And like those past moments, I think people being in the street and there being confrontations with, with um, authorities, um, those are all normal things, right? What, what's the real question for me is to think about uh, what's, the, what's the scope of the political imagination of, of leaders now? Um, is it as great as, as it has been in the past? And, you know, I, I vacillate, I mean, I can be honest with you, I vacillate in my head about, about that issue, about the, the scope of the political imagination. I think for African Americans, there's always a great, a great sort of like liberatory vision that drives black politics. But the coalitions of actors that I, I, I think about in the context of past historical transformations in terms of systems and politics, I worry about um, that in a sort of contemporary landscape in part because of things like like the digital, the, the nature of the digital world. Um, so, so it's more complicated to me personally, um, but I, I, I tend to believe in people, the sort of like collective nature of humanity, even when I get down on um, what I see is sometimes like inhum inhumane policy from people in power. Um, you know, I wrote this blog post last week um, to say, you know, a lot of historians and history educators are like, I don't know how to navigate this moment. And I'm like, one of the superpowers of historians is that like, we know stuff and we know how to read and we know how to research because like you're saying all these nuances in history that lead up to this particular moment and can help provide us like context and nuance. I think it's so much more integral that we are thinking of our work as people involved with teaching and learning history, mobilizing the past, as it's a responsibility to highlight change and highlight resistance and highlight resilience um, in order to think about a transformation of society and moving forward. I, 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 I do think that is really important and, and I, I'm really interested in um, I have a lot of colleagues and we've been having these conversations about um, things like information fluency, which I know sounds yeah. weird, but um, which is like you often, I often talk to students about the difference between good information and bad information. Right. And, and, and like the idea of like, you know, how do you get good information? Right. And, and how do you recognize good information? And usually I do this in the context of like, Twitter is not the world. Right, like Twitter is not Twitter is not the not exactly the world. It's like a funhouse mirror version of the world. Um, but now, uh, especially um, the different the different digital spheres that people find themselves in, versus the physical spheres, and bridging the kinds of knowledge that these different spheres have into a coherent whole becomes really important. And I, like I I agree with you, like. I was posting about the, the Kerner report, the Kerner commission from 1968. Right. Cause I was like, e people have written about this years ago, right? Like <laughs> there was an urban riots in the United States in the late 1960s. And the government wrote a report and in the first like summary, they said, you need to stop this because you're creating a world one black, one white. And you're going to have to change that or horrible things are going to happen. It's going to take political will, right? Like that's like in the first couple of paragraphs and then just go on from there. Like you need to stop all of this, right? So it's not, we don't know what happened, 
Like we, we don't, it's not like we haven't been war. It's just like people choose to forget. Um, and so, yeah, that historical memory thing is real. Well, I, I think of like, you know, a couple themes that have come up on the series are things about like cultural amnesia, social amnesia. Natasha Henry, who's the Ontario, the president of the Ontario Black History Society and a African Canadian history education specialist for the past two decades is like, this is about social death when we allow our like, our history sites to disintegrate and Joe McGill from the slave drilling project said the same thing. And it's, it's interesting the histories that can be revered um, for particular aims that keep things, that, that keep that maintain a past that actually wasn't, you know, like that maintain a past that doesn't highlight things like diversity and resilience and struggles for greater power and, um, and for like systematic shutting down of some of those conversations. Well, you know, I think we forget how important historically history has been for the future, right? And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I'm really interested in is Afrofuturism. And part of the reason that it appeals to me, my work, I work on comics as well as, as, as um, digital humanities things and history. And so there's an element here when you think about Afrofuturism, um, that the future, like the speculative is always an important part of, of a kind of future industry. And the future industry in itself relies on projecting the present into the future. So like colonizing the past is an important part of that process. Mm. So you know, national character is, is at some level tied up into the people in charge being able to like celebrate a very particular version of the past because they're in charge right now and that version of the past needs to validate them being in charge now so they can continue to project themselves into the future being in charge right and so um eliminating histories that don't don't support that narrative become an important part of of maintaining control right and so erasure is an important important part of that process and and it doesn't matter where you are in the western hemisphere there's a element of a kind of historical contest always at play in the public sphere because the people in charge are in charge and their version of the past which allows them to be in charge at some level needs to be validated and any counter version uh, of that story is is problematic Right. And so whenever we talk about making a more equitable history, it often becomes broadening the narrative of how we got to the place that we are, because that in turn broadens the possibility of how we might proceed into the future. There's another guy here. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, my, I, I don't necessarily work on futurisms. Um, per se, but I have talked a lot about like cr uh, creative nonfiction because I think it, things like creative nonfiction, which I think there's a lot of parallels with notions of futurism, allow, allow young people in particular to be able to read and write and think into the past in ways that can help them navigate where they are now to give them tools for the future, which is why I talk about imagining a new we, because I think that imagination is so important. And I also talk about how we need to do that within historical, within historic space, which is hilarious, because on your website, you have a whole like, like banner that says imagine space. And I was like, right. am I reading that right? Because because I think we're going to get along. <laughs> that we need to like imagine more within these historical spaces because it is through exploring the past, through imagining through the past that we can help see ourselves in a different, a different present and a different future potentially. And that's so important for students that routinely have encountered history in formal spaces that exclude any experiences that align with who they are. I think that I think that's really important. And when people think about um, 
the future part of the reason that I think digital humanities like digital things are important because they allow for us to sort of like make these more inclusive futures more available and more mm -hmm. more uh, accessible um, and you know part of the reason I have that imagined space on my website is because yeah in those imaginary spaces you see people in dialogue with all these potential futures a lot of times. I mean, when it's comic books or or speculative fiction, um, that's often them trying to reach beyond the constraints you know, offered by the system that they're in or being offered by um, the expectations that they've been given. And, it, and it's often very transformative, right? And right now I'm, I'm working on a, a project, uh, a summer project with this um, video archive called The History Maker digital archive one of the things that we've been looking at is how black people have used comics in their in their past lives to to inspire a different worldview and it, it's interesting because you find all the examples stretching back into like the 1940s and 50s where young african-americans were reading comics and it made them think about like rocket rocket ships and then they became a rocket scientist because they were like, oh, well, I, I read Buck Rogers. Then I saw Warner Burn Bond on in an article and I was like, this is a real thing. I could do this. And they did, right? So, so there's this potentiality around imagining uh, is really important and for the past and for, for teachers especially, I think digital schools offer a chance to connect their students with um, resources that they can use themselves to help imagine more complicated futures because there's there's always more happening than that's in the record that you that you were given right even when you go um, right now here in the United States they just recently announced they were taking down the monuments um, to the Confederate generals in Richmond, Richmond Virginia which is you know on Monument Avenue and those spaces have been part and parcel of a very elaborate narrative of white supremacy. And on the one hand, getting rid of those, those physical spaces, those physical statues, and, and taking them away as these symbols of white supremacy, which is what they are, is very good. But there's a part of me that wants them to think this as much about what are the new statues and the new markers that will sort of create a more equitable future that could be in those spaces, right? So you remove these things that were distortive, false histories. Can you put something into that place, in, the, in that place that will be these sort of affirmative, more inclusive figures of history? And I think that they can. Um, it's just a question of will they, right? Uh, and so there's always this sort of interesting tension around, you know, having access to a more complicated story, which I think we increasingly do because of digital things. We just have to find the, the time and the means to integrate them into the stories that we're sort of required to tell, right? Like everybody has like their learning outcomes and <laughs> lesson plans that, that they're supposed to right. do, but it can be done for sure. So that seems, uh, I have a cat here, that seems like a good segue to the second question <laughs> of, the, of the three question like discussion we're having about whether or not you think that history education will change after this moment. And, you know, when I've asked this question before, this moment was just the pandemic and this moment has become so much more significant. And what I often hear people say is like, I hope, but there is there isn't a very clear way about I will or um, or it, it will or that this is the way it needs to happen. Do you have any thoughts? Do you think it will change after this? Do you think like what what would you imagine that would look like? Although the, the next question is about imagining, so if you want to save that, that's okay too. Um, I think that there's a lot of pressure on educators right now to sort of mm -hmm. deliver on the most basic elements of education, right? And I think about this um, as a real sort of challenge. And so when you ask, will education change? Like the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes, education is gonna change. But the, the problem is that it might change for the worse. 
<laughs> right, because yeah. I, I think one 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 way that education is going to change is um, there is going to be, I think, a greater sort of like engagement with technology, and that will create a number of different um, new chasms within the educational experience of students, right? So um, as we all know, we're all, we're all working from home right now, and you're at the mercy of your internet connection, right? There were a number of stories uh, in the spring semester as we were forced to start teaching online about people in the K through 12 who did not have internet at home. And even if you do have internet at home, is the nature of your internet, the quality of your internet any good? I mean, in the United States, we used to talk very deliberately about the digital divide, but I often point out to students, even though they don't talk about that anymore, it still exists, but it's a quality, right? It's a quality divide. And the reason I say that is because the reason they don't talk about the digital divide as much as they used to is because a lot of people now have access to the internet, but they have it through mobile devices. And that's not the same as saying I have access to the internet through a desktop device. It's just not. So I know students, I know some of my students did their work when they left through their phones, right? Even though I was like, that's not the best way to write an essay. They did it through their phones. Um, we will have to wrestle with the reality of an uneven access to an online environment. And again, it becomes a question of how is the state going to address that? Is it going to address it as some, some um, school districts in the United States did by giving kids like iPads or, you know, laptops or something? Which is an answer, but that doesn't mean that they have the greatest um, internet service provider. It just means they had a, a, an iPad, right? Uh, you know, who's going to pay for that? Uh, there are wild, wildly different levels of funding uh, for educational institutions and educational districts uh, in the United States. And, and, and some of them have stuff that are like cutting edge and some of them do not. And so that's one element. I think like we're going to have a kind of weird um, new set of chasms that develop between educational institutions. And we're also gonna have sort of private sector sort of growth, right? Because I get an email every day about a new tool I can use in class. And I know some stuff about digital things and can say, no, I don't wanna do this. Um, or I can say, I can find an open source version of that thing that you just want to sell me. So I'm not gonna do this. Um, but how many people know that, right? Like how many people know that there's like a sort of like OER, an open electronic resource environment that they can use to supplement their work. Like that in itself is a, a education that teachers have to do while at the same time they have to also do the normal things they have to do when they're teaching, right? And so supporting all those, all those sort of like um, growth areas in terms of, of the resources that, mental resources that teachers need, giving them access to things helping students with like questions around accessibility, like the, all of those are real challenges. So at the end of the end of the day, yeah, I think education is gonna change because like the, the pressure on institutions right now coming out of the pandemic and these protests are, are gonna be magnified across the next several years. And there will be changes just because some institutions in the United States context, I don't mean this as a hyperbole, some institutions will not survive. Mm -hmm. They will not get enough students. Their funding will decline. Um, there are going to be institutions of a certain size that are not going to be able to, to handle this, or they're going to come out the other side a radically different uh, institution. 
And so that's a that's a real a real concern. I think we all should have because every decision that they make around trying to stay alive um, may in fact involve something like seeking funding or making partnerships with for-profit entities that will require X, Y, and Z, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think I think that's that's a discussion that we're not really having now, but we're probably going to have more and more. You know, one of the things I was thinking of when you were saying, like, I know some students wrote their their essays on phones, is that, like, I have done I've done a little bit of digital humanities work, not definitely to the extent that you have, and like, even though in like the OER you know guide that that um, I put together, I said to professors like, don't you don't need to use fancy technologies, like just use Word to do like an annotation of a digital image, but like. Even that you can't do on a phone, <laughs> you know? So like on one hand, there are these educators that are like coming up with amazing, amazing ideas about how to bridge and develop learning opportunities in these online and digital spaces, but they might not translate to a phone. So if, if you know, writing is something that we can do on our phones, we might not be able to do anything else. And so like that, that's a really interesting kind of element too, right? Like the digital, if we are imagining the digital on a laptop or on a desktop, that is not effective as if we are like, okay, create a digital story through TikTok, which please don't explain it to me. I don't get it. And I don't really want to know. <laughs> or like an Instagram story, right? Like, like think of these other ways that can be done on a phone as a way to create greater opportunities for students to engage but through the technologies they have available, if at all. Yeah, I, I do think that's, that's true. I mean, um, some websites that we have access to, of course, there's a, there's a mobile view, right? Um, but you lose, like, you, you lose something on the mobile view, right? So mm. they, can, they can look at things on their phones, but it doesn't look exactly like it looks on their laptop. Nine times out of ten, that may not, man, probably 75%. It may not matter. It's more than, no, I'm not going to get to 80%. Um, <laughs> but for some people, um, that environment won't work, like accessibility, which is which mm -hmm. is a, a concern, right? Uh, visual accessibility, uh, you lose things uh, when things, something is on, on a smaller screen, right? And, and the adjustments that can be made for something on the lap laptop in terms of like some of the accessibility tools, I don't know that all of those pour over to the cell phone. Like sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, from what I can tell. But I haven't done a systematic review, and that and that will be that will be something that people have to keep in mind. Um, I mean, I do think that there are things that people can do that are really interesting. Um, that are online, right? Like I, of course, think about um, assignments that 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 sort of flip the idea of what kind of uh, work that students can do. That they can do much more work that is like critical and creative, um, working in an online environment because they can take the raw materials, sort of primary sources in my case, and and use them in a story mode, for instance, like making a visual essay and a lot of people have access to google slides and so you can talk to them about using google slides to do a photo essay i, I did that uh, last year, a year before last as a final a final assignment or, and things like that and so like that if they do have access to the mobile version of that it doesn't look exactly the same but they can sort of figure it out but there you you kind of have to think creatively, I think, and and you have to think about what do they have access to. Um, and that's why like having, you know, talking to them about some of the, the open sources on the web um, becomes really important in terms of like quality of information that they have access to. Um, but yeah, it's there there are opportunities. So I don't want to say like when we talk about is education is your education going to change? 
not all going to be bad, but there's definitely going to be like these weird challenges associated with it. And I, I wonder about the discussions that that we're having about that. And, I, I, and to me, um, as someone who's thinking about teaching in the fall right now and thinking about what does an online class look like, because the reality is I'm probably going to be teaching online mm -hmm. in some significant function. Um, it's, it's different than thinking about a face-to-face -face class without question, so. It is, and, and I mean, I see more potential for this remote emergency online teaching to be more student-centric, right? To be, to, to not be like, okay, let's just have this like huge array of content that we need to ensure that students like know and revere, but rather to find spaces for co-creation because like with some of the digital technologies, like the students know better than us, like maybe not you, but <laughs> the students would know better than me not knowing TikTok. And like, maybe we can get them to help co-create these assignments and assessments. Like for me, that's a real key, exciting possibility. But I know that like just the idea of that can be really daunting to educators, um, which is why I think it's yeah. good for them. Yeah making a TikTok video, which I've never made a TikTok video. Okay, I know what TikTok you. is, but I don't really, you know, do anything with it. But make an Instagram story. Like I had a colleague who, who who had students, they created a class Instagram and one of the final assignments was like students taking over the class Instagram and telling a story using the class Instagram as a sort of final essay. Um, and you know, they all had access to that that class Instagram account, and you know, they made the story, and she sort of evaluated the Instagram story using the criteria, and things like that are totally doable. Um, but you know, Instagram owns that now, right. <laughs> which I'm like, eh, eh, yeah, not. that's a question. I mean, it's like, how many battles can you can you fight at once? <laughs> Fine, fine Instagram, take it. <laughs> um, okay, let's let's move to the last question about imagining a new we. Um, so this is a, a concept that I came up with when I saw teachers, mainly white teachers in classrooms, mainly full of racialized students, really like making this clear divide between like, like our history and like their history. And like, let's just make sure they know Canadian history because I'm in a Canadian context. And then, then, then it's important so we'll get to black history too and i'm like you know black history isn't for black students <laughs> um black history is part of my history because it's white supremacy and i'm a white person and i need to understand that and she's like yes no definitely but also let's just teach the main story first and so it's like we need to imagine greater circles of inclusion in the narratives that we tell that allow us to recognize these diverse histories and not in ways that are just like add and stir because that is not, not that's not the thing. In ways that allow us to, to shape a different future of what a we might look like and to shape, um, to allow us to really shift and change what community and connection might look like as we move into the 21st century. So with all that being said, do you have any ideas about whether or not we can imagine a new we during or after this moment in, in different ways? And, you know, some people are just like, no, I think the concept of we is problematic and, you know, that is fair too. Um, I still think though that, that this notion, I really appreciate you laughing. <laughs> uh, right? <'Cause> you <laughs> I just don't know that like I would throw away we as a concept. I'm like that seems a little extreme. Um, I get it, but um, yeah, you know, I think that yeah, I'm gonna state that I'm I'm in favor of we. Um, I know that seems simplistic, but as I say, I, I tend to, I tend, I do tend to like think about a collective humanity that to move forward right historians know that the past was worse than the present like i'm never i'm never like really i'm never unclear about that 
I am doing better than my great great grandparent. Period. Right. So I I know that. Um, but at the same time, I I do understand what you mean about the the place of um, the uh, the quote unquote other in the dominant narrative. And I sometimes think about this in terms of, you know, history is like a great action adventure story. Like it's a, it's a great whatever story you want it to be, right? But I, I like action adventure stories. So to me, it's a great action adventure story. It could be a great romance story if you like romance stories. Like, but to me, it's a great action adventure story. <laughs> well, from your background, before you switch to this one, that I, I like, I, I knew that was right, good comment. Good comic book. Um, yeah, it was kind of background. <laughs> so, so as a great action adventure story, um, there's always like heroes and villains, right? And so by default, in action adventure stories of the past, the villains were always the people who weren't white, right? Like, you know, right. it's black people, brown people, yellow people, you know, whatever color you want, they were the bad guy. Uh, and then they had like a loyal- But, but also loyal people, people don't see color. White, black, green, purple, right? Yeah. It just so happens. Yeah. It just so happens. Yeah. <laughs> All the villains yeah. were white. Yeah, it just so happened that they were. Uh, so, but because it's like a story that that has like you know these sort of in action adventure, action adventure context, like you know there there is like a central action figure, like that's giving point of view. Like there's a point of view character in the story. And I think like when I think about telling the histories, I'm like, well, you can switch the point of view character and a couple of things happen. One, you can till, 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 uh, still tell the same story, right? Like you can tell, you can do a point of view shift in the American Revolution and till, still tell the same story of like America becoming free. It's just that the nature of why and how and who did what when, it, it shifts a little bit, right? And yeah. there's a lot of historical fiction that does this, right? They'll they'll take a character and they'll be there and then and, and they'll, you know, be in a room and George Washington's on the other side, but they're doing this other thing that's really important. But they're real people are like that, right? And so I, I do think that, like that, that effort to shift the point of view, to find the point of view characters that bring people of color and women into the center of the action because they were there and they're just being ignored, right? They were there, but they're just being ignored. What does that mean for all these stories? Like sometimes those people um, are quote unquote the villain, but you know, like every action adventure story, the truly great villains aren't villains. They think they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Like they have a really clear vision of like why they're doing what they're doing. They're, they're just on the wrong side of the story, right? So in history, the people who are on the quote unquote wrong side of the story, they're really great villains because they have a good reasonable reason why they did it. And if you get into it, you can see why they are doing what they're doing. Like it doesn't change the story to give the villain you know, they're competent villains. We all we all enjoy a competent villain in an action adventure story. <laughs> like they make it more exciting. A competent villain makes things more exciting. Like let's just be honest, right? Um, and so that those are those are things that people can do. They can they can shift the point of view characters, make the story a little less about those people that everyone knows. It's still the same story. And they can give the villains their due. Right, don't 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 ignore that what they said or why they said it. Instead, like bear down and be like, yeah, they had a good point of view. And what does it mean for us to think about our heroes, quote unquote, um, in the con through the lens of the that person who was in opposition, their antagonists, right? Protagonists and antagonists, not not heroes and villains, but protagonists and antagonists, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because many of these people who are quote unquote, you know, villains, they're now your neighbors, right? Like they, they, their descendants are, are right around the corner. You eat their food, 
So they're not villains. They're they're and they were at one point on the opposite side of a of a conflict. That conflict ended, and there was a peace. And they had to make they had to come to terms with that peace because they didn't have the power to impose their peace. And so they they become a part of the whole. And what does it mean? What was what was the consequences of that for them? You know. In the American context, one of the things that's really, really, really a, a, a historical moment is how the South won the peace, right? Like, you know, they, they told a different history. They told a different version of history that justified their, their continued white supremacy, even though the system that gave birth to white supremacy, slavery, was overturned. So they created a whole story a mythology that that justified their supremacy, their white supremacy, and allow for them to be violent still, it allows for them to do all these things. And that that's an example in the American context of like how important telling a story can be. And so when you're a teacher and you're together the 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 narrative, like when you're when you're, you know, in my version, the action adventure story, when you're putting together the like point of view characters, you don't have to ignore how it's going to end it's always going to end the same way but you can get there lots of different ways and mm -hmm. the way you make those decisions will really matter to students well and like get students to do choose your own adventure right like I don't, yeah, right. I, exactly. yeah like i don't know why we we i mean the students that i worked with like I kept thinking I'd have to like convince them of how important history is. And they're like, no, we know, do it better. <laughs> um, like they weren't saying that to like me, but they were saying that in the interviews, like we, we know this. And some students were saying like the most interesting history I've ever learned was in elementary school. Cause we got to do arts and crafts around it. Like it wasn't just sit here and tell me the story. Because I think of like, it's not action adventure. I think you mentioned romance. It's not that either. It's a musical. <laughs> but I think, of, like, I think of Hamilton. Like, I think of the musical Hamilton and so much of what you're saying that, like, like Burr and Hamilton are both these characters that we see their complexities and the, the casting and the ways that the story is able to kind of present itself forces you to think new ways about the present. Right. Um, and I just think that's just so powerful. So thank you so much for just bringing that to this conversation. It's been, this has been so wonderful. Oh, no, no problem. Thanks. Thanks for, like I said, thanks for asking me. It's uh, always nice to, to think about teaching and uh, I know, <laughs> as every teacher knows, you're always wondering, am I doing a good job with this? <laughs> Look, I, 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 I think that all the time, like, mm. <laughs> I'd sometimes tell the students like, this was not a good one, but I'll do better next time. Right? Like I've I've said that in the, at the end of a class, like, yeah, this wasn't a great story. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um well I mean the opposite too, but you know, like that was awesome. <laughs> you guys should be really pleased. <laughs> I'm sorry I wasn't you for this one, because <laughs> But I mean, like one of the things that I like I, I've written in the past is like, like to work with your students, like think of it as a learning community and like you as an educator, I don't mean you, but like maybe you don't need to be the expert. You can just help guide them through the like exploration of these topics. Um, and so if the class is bad, it's their fault, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I'm going to use that. Do it. This sucks do it. because of you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. What you this class sucked because of you today. So take that on. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's different because of an online learning environment. I like, I was like, I don't have the same tricks. Like, it's not like I had a lot of tricks, <laughs> but um, if I'm staring at like all these black boxes, cause students don't have like a webcam or they don't want to turn it on. It's like, it's like hard to know if things are landing, you know? So yeah, yeah, it is real good yeah, to be totally to educators uh, moving forward, but especially in this in this new milieu. 
I hear you. Yeah, I totally get that. Well, Julian, thank you so much. Um, and uh, and hopefully we, we stay connected. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to checking out the series. And thanks again for asking me to participate. Thank you so much, and um, uh, I'll put a, I'll, I'll provide the, all the links to your work and any other resources that you think might be useful for people or comic books that you want them to read uh, below the video as well. Okay. Okay. All right. See you later. Bye.